Oh, God, it's a mess. No, no, Bobo! Bobo! Hey, Bobo! Look out! Oh, I'll never see Kyle again. <laughs> okay, here goes. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk. I'm here to talk to you about South Park. Or more specifically, Kenny McCormick. Or Kenny, as Cartman will call him. <laughs> Did you see the scratch, Kenny? And his family. His father, Stuart. His mother, Carol. His brother, Kevin. And his sister, Karen. One of the few good Karens. Ever so long ago, I made a video entitled, Who is the Worst Mom in South Park? Where I talked about Linda and Sheila. Linda is out or polite. If his neglect was something to be laughed at, well, Sheila is a bad person, but not as bad as the song says. But maybe Many of you said I overlooked several candidates. Leanne, who I already talked about, but I might make another video on, and Kenny's mom, Carol. The truth is, that video was originally meant to be a spectrum of the South Park moms, starting from best to worst. Not just the main five, but all of them which meant a couple dozen candidates. But it got to be too much of a hassle, so I just talked about Sheila and Linda. Now, I'll be honest, I think outside of Cartman and Butters, Kenny has the worst life out of anybody in town. South Park is still a comedy, but once you strip that away, Kenny has a terrible life. Realistically. Realistically being the key word here, is Kenny is regularly made fun of for his lack of wealth. So, Let's discuss. Kenny is one of the five main boys. He is notable for a lot of traits, like his lust for buxom women, his parka, which muffles his speech, and a certain running gag. According to Trey Parker, he based Kenny off of one of his childhood friends, who was also named Kenny. He shared many traits with his cartoon counterpart. Real life Kenny would always wear an orange parka, was extremely poor, and would always skip class. To which the other kids would joke, oh, Kenny died again. Hey, Look, I think Kenny's okay. <laughs> oh yeah, let's talk about that. First off, Kenny is known for being a living, running gag. In the first five seasons, Kenny would die once an episode, to which Kyle and Stan would recite, Oh my god, they killed Kenny! You but in the next episode, Kenny would always return. Sometimes his death relates to the episode, like in Spontaneous Combustion, where Kenny is the first casualty. Other times, it's totally random. However, there were several occasions where Kenny beat the odds and survived. In Mr. Hankey, the episode constantly baits and switches that Kenny will die. Kenny, would you please go over and pull the light cords out of the wall? Careful now, Kenny. Those are very, very dangerous. Only for nothing of the sort to happen. You know, it seems like something's still not right. Yeah, something feels unfinished. In truth, Matt and Trey did not want to kill him off because it was Christmas. So happy early Christmas. The second episode was Rainforest Man Forest. I hope I'm saying this right. Where Kenny was killed by a lightning bolt. <laughs> Much to the shock of his pseudo girlfriend, Kelly. Uh, who? Who killed him? They did. Who's they? You know, they. Out of desperation, Kelly tries CPR, and Kenny wakes up. Come on, Benny! Breathe! <coughs> Whoa, dude! Now, there were times when Kenny's death was played as seriously as possible. In the movie, Kenny dies as a result of medical incompetence. Damn it! It never gets any easier! Upon his death, he discovers he has a plethora of sins, the most damning being not going to church, as his mother warned. Okay. Well, sorry, Carol, but Kenny did not want to end up on the Catholic boat with Father Maxie. As a result, Kenny is sent to hell for all warrants, yada yada yada, and out of gratitude, Satan tells Kenny he'll grant him a wish. So Kenny wishes that everything would go back to normal before this horrible war. 
Wait, Teddy's death was the catalyst for the war, so shouldn't he come back to life in addition to everything else? Or since this is basically a Faustian bargain, is it Kenny's fault for wording it wrong? He could have said, I just only think I can get from here when I feel like he really died. In Cartman land, Cartman inherits a fudge load of money from his dead grandmama, which he splurges on his own theme park in order to avoid lines, lines, lines. If there's one thing I hate, all the lines, 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 lines. Unfortunately, Cartman learns that he must pay for the upkeep of the theme park, and reluctantly, and I mean with great reluctance, lets people inside. He's bringing the grand total to... God damn it. 816 people can come into the park today! <laughs> One such person is Kenny. <laughs> Kenny's family sues, and likely because Cartman did not show up to court, he has to pay them a massive lawsuit, on top of other issues. Hey! Hey, that's my buddy! There's also the lawsuit of the little boy who died in your park. Dude, you had an easy case. You could have said Kenny did that to himself. There was evidence. The family's entitled to the rest of this. What, Kenny? He dies all the time! Now, I think this is one of the few acknowledgements that Kenny regularly dies, but not every occasion is made with such gusto. Sometimes they're a solemn affair. In the aptly titled, Kenny Dies, Kenny ends up in the hospital with a muscular disease and isn't given very long to live. But the doctors are gonna make him better, right? That's what hospitals are for, they, they can make him better. Randy. They don't think so, Stanley. No offense, but this must happen on a daily basis. I'm surprised you don't have a funeral suit on the ready. If you couldn't guess, this episode takes Kenny's death and deconstructs it, playing it up for all the tear-jerking it's worth. In fact, this episode was inspired by a Monty Python skit that never came to be, where you try to see how far you can go without telling a single joke. So the entire episode plays out like a cheesy soap opera. Yeah, I didn't think so. You know, I'm just like the fetuses, Chuck. I wasn't born yesterday either. Uh-huh. Even Cartman is sad when he finds out. <laughs> Cartman? Oh, Kyle. Hey, what's going down, Jew boy? Upon discovering there's no cure, Cartman vows to use stem cells to help Kenny. <laughs> I'm gonna find a cure, Kyle. I swear to God, I'm gonna find a cure. Sure you will, Cartman. Sure you will. Once he finds out stem cell research is banned, since this was the early 2000s, he ends up going all the way to Congress to testify on why they should be funding this. I love Kenny McCormick, and, and I want you to love him too. <laughs> wow, Carmen actually managed to do something bipartisan. Why did he want to be a rabbi? He should have gone into politics. Or why not both? He could have been the Jewish equivalent to Jesse Jackson. It works, and stem cells can once again be studied. Cartman goes to work, getting more stem cells, like going to a clinic. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that because uh, there's a little boy dying in a hospital right now who sure could use that baby more than you could. Well, I guess we can always just make another one. Regardless, the others are unable to cope, and Stan and Kyle demonstrate the most extremes. Kyle wants to be strong for Kenny and never leaves his side, no matter how much it hurts. See, here's one from Butters. It says, we can't wait to see you back in school, Kenny. And it has a picture of him and you in a little airplane. Meanwhile, Stan is upset about what happened, but doesn't want to be anywhere near him, not wanting to face the inevitable. He needs us right now. I can't see him like that, Kyle. All those hoses and wires, He's a kid, dude. He's supposed to be running around and laughing. Which, I hate to say it, but when grief and death and tragedy happens, I'm Stan. Doesn't mean you love that person any less. It's just a really hard thing to reconcile. The two will often get into fights over it. Stan, you can't leave. I'm not the one who's leaving. He is. Chef, thankfully, makes him see the light by saying why life is so cruel. Sometimes God takes those closest to us because it makes him feel better about himself. He's all pissed off about something we did thousands of years ago. It don't matter to him so long as it makes us sad. Still, dying is never fun, so the Make-A-Wish Foundation comes to make Kenny's last days memorable. What did he say? He said his wish is not to die. 
Oh, okay. Oh, no. No kid, no. At least he isn't like Kimberly Akimbo. She wished for a treehouse. Instead, he's granted the chance to meet Madonna. I bet you'd like to meet Madonna, huh? <laughs> He said Madonna's Florida welcome years ago, and she should go f herself. Should I come in now? Uh, not, not quite yet. I will scratch that. Stan eventually is able to gather up the strength to see Kenny, but he's too little too late. Hey, Kenny! In fact, as Kyle describes, it wasn't a pretty picture. Did he say anything before he went? He just said, Where's Stan? Stan, look, it's in these dark times when we must <clears throat> turn it off like a light switch, just go click. But all hope isn't lost. Corbin still has stem cells. Even if he doesn't cure Kenny, he can reenact Lorenzo's oil and cure another little boy with the same affliction. <laughs> it's Cartman. Look, I put the stem cells from all the fetuses I had next to Shaggy's and they are replicating a new Shaggy's. It worked! Now, I know some of you say, oh, this was his plan all along, but the optimist in me likes to think the best of Carbon. Throughout the show, Carbon frequently calls Kenny his best friend, regardless of the benefit and regardless of making fun of him. Kenny and I have been BFF since first grade. Here, look. Kenny has the other half of this BFF necklace. I believe you all know what that means and how serious this is. He even has a BFF necklace to commemorate it. And in Black Friday, he was the most hurt about Kenny leaving their side. So my head canon is Cartman was trying to save Kenny, but when he found out his efforts were for nothing, he did not want to waste all the resources and just went with his original plan. Still, this cheers up a grieving Kyle and Stan. <laughs> I wasn't Kenny's worst f -f -f friend. Cartman was. No fun fact. This change was a long time coming, probably as far back as season four. Matt and Trey wanted to kill off a character. However, they could not decide on a candidate. Originally, it was gonna be Kyle, as they thought he and Stan were too similar, which I kind of get. One such proposal involved Kyle moving away. However, two things happened. One, they decided things would be too bleak without Kyle, which I agree with. And two. Kyle and Stan diverged enough that they decided to keep them on. The next person they chose was Kenny, as they found the gag of killing him off to be stale and were running out of ideas. This change was originally going to be permanent, but a combo of Comedy Central breathing down their necks and massive fan outrage caused Matt and Trey to bring Kenny back in the episode Red Slay Down. Don't worry, we'll get there. In season six, the boys try to find a new fourth of friend, including Butters and Tweak, but nobody seems to stick, and they mourn Kenny whenever they can. And you know, we've been trying to fill the gap with a fourth friend ever since Kenny died, God rest his soul, and it hasn't been an easy process. Now, I'll be honest, I might get a lot of hate for this, but I did not really miss Kenny. <laughs> Even before season 6, he didn't really do anything that caught my attention. I think the only Kenny-centric episode, off the top of my head, that I call my favorite is Cartman joins Nambula. Hooray season 6, I mean. In fact, season 6 has some of my favorite episodes, like The Deaf Camp of Tolerance, or Child Abduction is Not Funny. And I didn't notice Kenny was missing in any of those episodes, even if they do make the occasional joke. Well, sure, that's easy for you to say. Your son's dead. But those of us with the live children need to be sure that Father Maxie is on the up and up. Was I did not get into South Park until I was in middle school, long after this all happened. I knew what to expect, and that kind of lessened the impact. Still, Matt and Trey were compelled to bring him back, and this led to a season-long storyline. In Ladder to Heaven, the boys win a shopping spree at the candy store. However, they can't provide proof of a receipt and discover that Kenny had it on his person when they died. Here, you hold on to it, Kenny. Kenny. Woo -hoo. Well, honey, what are you waiting for? They learn from their parents that Kenny has been cremated, but his spirit is in heaven, to which they try to build a ladder to get there. A ladder to heaven? Why, son? Because we want to see Kenny again. Oh. 
because, you know, we can't just ask Jesus Christ himself. Not understanding the concept of cremation, Carmen thinks that Kenny's ashes are chocolate milk mix and ends up drinking it. Yeah, not bad. Ooh. Which leads to Kenny's favorite possessing him for several episodes. What did you say? What did you say? I said, shut up, Carmen, you. He tries every manner of exercising him, eventually needing to go to Chef's parents' house in Scotland. God damn it! The spirit's out and don't have nowhere to go! Eventually, that's all abandoned as Kenny returns safe and sound at the end of Red Slay Down. Hey guys, what's going on? Oh, hey Kenny. Dude, where have you been? <laughs> Still out of spite, and likely because his sole purpose was to be made fun of by everybody else, Kenny has become kind of out of focus nowadays. Either he won't appear, or he will, but he'll just sit back and not say anything. He'll be lucky to even get a line. Now, even if I did not really like Kenny pre-season 6, that doesn't mean I outright hate him. And I agree, when he gets the limelight, it can be pretty memorable. Except in the episode with the chicken. Randy stole the spotlight that time. <laughs> Nevertheless, there is the occasional episode where he catches my attention, like in The Ring, where he dates Tammy Wheeler, the only girl poorer than him, and who was older than him by one grade. Well, apparently Kenny has a girlfriend. Yeah, dude, Tammy Warner. She's a fifth grader. Nice. Butters learns that Tammy is a huge S-bag, as despite her young age, she gave another kid a BJ in the parking lot of TGI Fridays. Well, I just talked to Brad Dixon. Tammy Warner is bad news. All the fifth graders call her a <laughs> on account of she gave this kid Dave Darsky a BJ in the parking lot of TGI Fridays. The boys try to break this to Kenny gently. Your girlfriend's a <laughs> dude. He goes to ask Tammy if the rumors surrounding her are true. There's a lot of rumors going around about me. Well, it's true. But it was before you and I were together, and it wasn't my fault. Kenny tries to recreate the event by taking Tammy to a Jonas Brothers concert. And God, I'm old. I still remember going to one of their concerts in Atlantic City. Anyhow, you have to give Kenny credit for how much effort he puts into this scheme, and how much money he likely shelved out. That's probably what his mom makes in a year. Kenny, you're gonna let a girl put her mouth on your wiener? Do you know how disgusting that is? Girls' mouths are full of germs! Thankfully, he does the smart thing and buys rubbers. Statistically speaking, the most bacteria-ridden place on the planet is the mouth of an American woman. And you're gonna let that near your Whoop! <laughs> Woohoo! He toughs it out at the Jonas Brothers concert, where outside of Mr. Slave, he's the only other dude in the audience. Kenny is ready for his due, but before they can go to TGI Fridays, Tammy is summoned backstage to meet the Jonas Brothers. They want me to come backstage? Oh my god! It's a dream come true! Oh! No, they're gonna steal his thunder. Hey there, girl! Thankfully, they don't, since they're like twice their age at minimum. But this leads into another problem. The Jonas Brothers try to encourage the girls to wear purity rings, a sign they won't do nasty stuff until marriage. Tammy accepts, and Kenny is forced to go along with it. He gets to be so bored. In fact, I think he catches the same disease that Stan and Randy have. He rents Grey's Anatomy. Oh god, I hate that show. He hangs out with other couples and he rents Netflix. Kenny, Kenny, wanna look at Playboys? Wanna, wanna get high sniffing paint? Kenny, you want your Grey's Anatomy back, Kenny? Kenny is effectively neutered until the boys try to break his bunk by making Mickey Mouse out to be a Christian hating fraud on live TV. Even the Christians are too stupid to figure out I'm selling to their daughters. I've made billions off of Christian ignorance for decades now. <laughs> and also a major hypocrite. Where would you be without me, Jonas Brothers? <laughs> Your music sucks and you know it. Purity rings make it okay to do whatever I want. How is this news to anybody? Tammy decides to live while they're young and takes Kenny to get his long-awaited BJ. Let us all be reminded that syphilis is still a deadly disease. 
and it can be caught even if using protection. Well, you have to use protection the right way, and Kenny probably bought the wrong size. I also like Kenny in the episode The Scoots, which has gotten way more relatable for me going to college in the city. Halloween is right around the corner, and the boys decided to use e-scooters to get to all of the best houses in the fastest amount of time. Unfortunately, Kenny can't join because he's poor and can't afford a phone. Kenny, I always told you that one day, being poor was gonna catch up with you. Okay, but you didn't want to listen. You just kept on being poor, and now it's Halloween, and you don't have a cell phone. For this one episode. Usually he can in others. Great, cool. You got your pail. Oh, but he had a pail. Kenny tries to switch to the other guy click, and like before, he's refused. We're gonna trick-or-treat on e-scooters this year. We're seriously gonna rake in the candy. Problem is, e-scooters work with a phone, and pretty sure you don't. So he tries once again, this time going for the girls. I think you can figure out what happens. You want to trick or treat with us? Why? <laughs> Turns out Kyle, Stan, and Cartman were not the only kids who had this idea. Literally everybody and their mother is going to go scooting, and it will be a problem of epic proportions. In fact, it's advised that every house has six grand worth of candy, because those Please take one balls don't work. Kenny feels a little left out, and he's joined by Mr. Mackey. What do you mean? You, you can't use those things without a phone? No. <laughs> they decide to stop the upcoming crisis by destroying the nearby cell phone tower. On the drive over, Mr. Mackey and Kenny have a really touching heart to heart. I know, we kind of all forget about you sometimes, but you're smart, compassionate. You might even make a good counselor someday. Sounds like that's coming from a place. Their plan is ultimately successful, and Halloween is saved. However, his future self spells out a bit of foreboding. It was the last Halloween that still felt like Halloween. It was the last time it was good. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get to his home life, roughly halfway into the video. As explained before, Kenny is the poorest kid in South Park and lives on the edge of town in a cruddy little shack, one that his father and Gerald built in their youth. It's to the point where, on Thanksgiving, everybody donates food with the expectation that it's going to Kenny's family. A canned food drive is when we collect canned food for poor people who can't afford to eat on Thanksgiving. You mean like Kenny? Exactly. However, it's almost all Crean's corn. Please bring in more diverse food, children, or else Kenny's family's gonna have a pretty corny Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Before he gets mauled by killer turkeys, Kenny completes the annual tradition of going into a gravel lux and taking as much food as possible. Happy, happy Thanksgiving! Let her rip! Come on, grab those cans, little boy! So all his family has for Christmas is a can of green beans, which they hate. A, a, a can of string beans! <laughs> They have that in common with Jeffy. To make matters worse, nobody bought to donate a can opener. Does anybody have a can opener? God damn it. Or, you know, a can with one of those little, like, latch things. I think they have them for, like, campbells. Jenny's parents, Stuart and Carol, are drug-toting alcoholic rednecks who can barely keep a job. His mother occasionally works at the Olive Garden, washing dishes. But instead of spending money on their family, they spend it on drugs. <coughs> You're hogging it all, Because <coughs> I paid for it, you stupid you paid for it with the money I made washing dishes at the Olive Garden! Now, I'll be honest, I like Stuart the same way I like Steve and Chris, where I won't deny he's terrible, but it's what makes him funny. Randy is funny, but he can get to be a little overused, whereas Gerald started off as a good character who later got derailed and never faced consequences or saw the light. And yeah, I'm still pissed. Stuart doesn't appear as often as the other dads, so we know less about him than we should. In the episode, Chicken pox, Kenny gets a chicken pox. What, you thought he got pink eye? Everybody calls his sickness herpes. No, most people don't realize that chicken pox is actually a form of herpes. 
Dude, you got herpes on your face. Shut up, brat. Actually, about 80% of the world has it. Have you ever gotten a cold sore? I think the most important reason Kenny got sick was because his parents have never heard of this little thing called the varicella vaccine. Or probably can't afford it, I'm sorry. After Shelly ends up at the hospital, the other moms decide the best thing to do is to have the other kids attend a pox party. Which, if you don't know, means having a party at the infected child's house. Since most people who get chicken pox don't get it again. And it's not as bad if you get it as a little kid. Mothers do it all the time. Oh yes, when I was a child, my mother had me go over to a little girl's house who had the chicken pox just so I would get it. And wow, I did not realize this used to be super common. I'm so glad I was born in 99. Much to their dismay, the kids are sent to Kenny's house. Carmen is most upset. How would you boys like to have a little slumber party at your friend Kenny's house tonight? No way, dude. Kenny's family is poor. They live in the ghetto. Shut up, Cartman. You're the second poorest kid in town. You can't even afford an iPad. At the slumber party, the kids are upset that there's no Nintendo, only a Coleco Vision. Where is the Nintendo? We don't have a Nintendo. We got a Coleco Vision plugged into the black and white TV. Oh my god. Oh, I'm finally young. And wouldn't you boys much prefer a PS4 or an Xbox One? For dinner, they have frozen waffles. What kind of side dishes will we be enjoying this evening with our frozen waffles? Am I to understand there will be no side dishes? Stewart asks Kyle about Gerald and goes into his life story. You know, your dad and I used to be best friends when we were teenagers. We even worked together at Pizza Shack. But he got promoted, went off to community college, and I didn't. You know why? Because your dad's Jewish. Stuart, why aren't you in more episodes? You and Cartman would definitely get along. Like I said in my Cartman video, I think part of why Cartman hates the Jews is because they remind him of Kyle, who he is jealous of and possibly in love with. Stuart hates them because they remind him of Gerald. Imagine the schemes they can come up with. As expected, the boys all get chicken pox, except Kyle. I'm sure you stayed over at Kenny's house. Yeah, dude, I told you we had bread sandwiches for breakfast. Thank you, Miss Information. Afterwards, Kyle inquires to Gerald about Stuart and why Kenny's family is poor and they aren't. So Gerald explains to him the concept of gods and clods. You see, I spent a lot of time going to law school and I was able to go because I have a slightly higher intellect than others. But I still need people to pump my gas and make my french fries. It leads into a whole subplot, but I'm not gonna talk about it here. Afterwards, Sheila takes Kyle to Kenny's house once again. And when Kyle won't get sick, she tries to get him to play other games. It's called Ookie Mouth. What's Ookie Mouth? First, you let Kenny spit in your mouth. Then you try to swallow his spit and say Ookie Mouth at the same time. Thank goodness, Sheila. I thought you meant the other kinds of ookie. I can't say ookie mouth and have Kenny spit down my throat at the same time. It's impossible. Practice makes perfect, Bobby. Ew, gross. This whole scene makes me nauseous. Ew. Sheila tells Carol that she wants the McCormicks and the Brothloskis to be close once again. But if they were such good friends, it seems silly that they don't even talk anymore. Let's get them together. I don't know. We'll just arrange a little fishing trip for them or something. And like usual, I know this plan will be so great because it came from SWOW. Stuart and Gerald go on a fishing trip. And as expected, it's just amazing. Balls. Say, remember that time we built the fort in your mom's backyard? It took us down there two years to finish it. <laughs> Whatever happened to that old hunk of junk? <laughs> That's where I live now. Oh, right. While Kyle realizes the truth about chicken pox parties, Gerald and Stuart think about their lives. You're a bitter old drunk just like your father. Ow! Now don't make me do that again. Ow! Bye, bye. However, they make up, and even if this episode is mostly meant to make fun of chicken pox and old customs, you think it's pretty sad when you start to think about it, to the point where it feels like a cautionary tale. Gerald and Stuart both came from different backgrounds. Gerald came from a rich family, but in spite of his origins, he sought to better himself. He studied hard and became a lawyer. Regardless of who his parents were, he earned his place in the world. Not everything was handed to him. Now, now he has a happy family and a good life. I wasn't lucky. You had rich parents. You gotta go to that expensive community college. Hey, I worked my ass off to get to where I am today. 
Stuart was born with a real bum deal. But instead of realizing I can sort about this and give my family what I never had, he uses this as an excuse to not do anything and stay where he is. It's because you are an alcoholic. He had dreams of not eating frozen waffles for dinner every night. Hey, is it my fault you don't know how to cook? What am I supposed to do with frozen waffles? You just don't know how to use spices and stuff. Whoa, they think they did something similar with Heidi, but Heidi deserves her own video. Also, I think it goes without saying that Stuart is possibly a groomer and a statutory rapist. Like, I'm not kidding. It's crazy when you start to think about it. Kenny's brother is 12 or 13, according to the wiki. Is he and Shelly seem to be the same age. And Carol is 26. Meanwhile, Stuart is 42. Now do the math. Holy crap, he got a girl pregnant when she was barely out of puberty. Somebody call Chris Hansen pronto. Regardless, they're terrible parents. And Kenny knows it. When Carmen joins Nambula, Kenny finds out that his parents Parents want to have another baby. Kenny isn't delighted. Wouldn't you like to have another brother or sister? No. And neither is Cartman. Damn it, poor people suck. Your family is already on welfare, and now you're gonna bring another kid into the world. Poor people are churning out babies, adding to the overpopulation, and then expecting me to pay for it with my tax dollars. Kerman, after what you did to your brother, you don't have the authority to tell parents what they can and can't do in terms of family size. Kenny has bad dreams about the possibility of having another sibling. And not gonna lie, his fears feel a little justified. You can't beat Kenny, we have to save food for the baby. Your mom and I are going out for a few weeks, Kenny. Take care of the baby. He tries to do whatever possible to keep his parents from bumping uglies. For example, he tries to forcibly sterilize his father. Oh! What happened? Oh, he smacked me in the balls! Oh. Oh. Unfortunately, his efforts are for naught. Doctor confirmed it. I'm pregnant. You're gonna have a little brother or sister. No. Thankfully, Kenny knows how to take care of such inconveniences. Under a disguise, he ends up buying enough morning after pills to permanently rupture Carol's ovaries and mixes them into her favorite drink. Strangely, Carol does not want it. But unfortunately, now that I'm pregnant, I can't drink. What? Not gonna lie, this sort of surprised me. I guess she learned her lesson, thank Cthulhu. Stewart drinks it for her, which constantly causes him to expel from both ends. I've had my nuts broken, body poisoned, and been made love to a by three dozen 40 year old men. I just wanna go home and take a, a hot bath. Next up, Kenny tries to get his mom to go on the John Denver experience. <laughs> Nothing seems to happen. So Kenny takes matters into his own hand and does something with that plunger. What are you doing, Kenny? Kenny, what are you going to plunge? <gasps> I don't know, use your imagination. Luckily, Stuart stops him in time. Of course, Kenny dies. <laughs> And this does nothing to deter his parents. Carol ends up giving birth to another baby and follows the Scottish tradition. I know it's been hard on both of us losing poor Kenny, but this new baby kind of reminds me of him. God, this must be the 50th time this has happened. 50 second. Oh, you're surprised? Well, I have news for you. Turns out, unlike the rest of the boys, Kenny has a special power. One that isn't imaginary. Regeneration. I can't die. Or that. He doesn't know how it happens either. Eventually, no matter what, I wake up in my bed, wearing my same old clothes. And the worst part, nobody even remembers me dying. In fact, he's so used to dying that he just shoots himself instead of walking home. At the end of Coon and Friends, the trilogy I mean, not the first episode, we find out how. What? What? It's happening again! How, Carol, but maybe this is karma for how you treat your children. And also because you joined a cult. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the cult. Turns out years ago, Stuart and Carol went to meetings with the cult of Cthulhu. Not because they believed in Cthulhu, but because they wanted free alcohol. Trust us, we don't remember. I, I know it sounds hard to believe, but we were actually really drunk the entire time.
I don't find that hard to believe at all. Perhaps because they were too drunk to notice, something happened to Carol, which leads to Kenny having extraordinary powers. However, Kenny later gained a sister in Karen, and he doesn't seem to resent her. Yay! Some episodes imply that Kenny basically has to watch himself and Karen because they can't be bothered. I'm telling my parents I'm staying at Stan's house, Stan's telling his parents he's staying at Kenny's house, and Kenny's not telling his parents anything because they're alcoholics and they don't care. Woo! As a result, Karen and Kenny have a strong bond. In the city part of town, South Park gentrifies a portion of the town, which of course leads to everything getting to be more expensive. But mommy, they have ice cream. We can't afford $10 ice cream, all right? If you want nice things, then go out and get a job! God, Stewart, take her to Taco Bell. Unlike Chipotle, it doesn't make you crap blood. Kenny tries to get a job to help support his family as part of Luke Kim's child labor force, but he can't afford to pay him that much, to which Stewart rubs in his face. Did you make any money? Hmm. Ha, told ya. That's how it works in this damn country. However, Kenny uses all the money he can to buy his sister a doll. Aww. Wow. You might be wondering why Kenny's parents are not in prison, and why Kenny continues to live in such circumstances. I mean, the police arrested the entire town because they molested the kids. Apparently, they haven't heard of this little thing called habeas corpus. Well, the poor kid answers that. In the episode, we find out that Stuart and Carol are running a meth lab in their backyard, and Kenny finds out through the reality TV show, White Trash. In trouble. <laughs> Carol and Stuart are arrested, and realizing they have a problem, the kids are sent to a foster home in Greeley, Colorado. But first, they must put up with the panic room, which includes pictures of clowns, their social worker, Mr. Adler, and his incessant Penn State jokes and headshots. I'm gonna get you to smile. I'm gonna get you to smile. A Penn State administrator walks into a bar. Where's that smile? Really, Colorado, as expected, sucks cow behind. For one, their new foster parents are strict agnostics who force them to conform to their fundamentalist interpretation of we don't know and who cares. For example, they can only drink Dr. Pepper and diet Dr. Pepper. We cannot know with certainty if God or Christ exists. They could. Then again, there could be a giant reptilian bird in charge of everything. Can we be certain there isn't? No, so it's pointless to talk about. Now say it with me. Okay, I'm agnostic and I love this episode. Is it bad I like Dr. Pepper too? Of course, Karen doesn't like being separated from her parents abusive or not, so she ends up crying herself to sleep at night. Thankfully, she has a guardian angel in the form of Mysterion. I was wondering when you'd appear. You always come when I'm sad. You are going to be okay, Karen. You have to keep believing that. Aww. Later, he even defends her from a bully who tries to steal her doll. Aww. Karen McCormick is off limits. Do you understand? Make sure everybody in this school knows. Because Kenny's foster siblings start talking about angels, the Weatherheads get mad. Stop it, children! We do not speak such certainties in this house! Which means it's time for the punishment room, where you are waterboarded with Dr. Pepper until you conform to their beliefs. Ah! Are there such things as angels? Maybe. Good! Ah! While well, Mr. Adler deals with the Weatherheads, thanks to Cartman tattling. Oh yeah, that was the whole thing, I'm sorry. Kenny dons his Mysterion disguise once again. Does he kick their behinds? Free all the kids so they can take revenge on them? No to all of that. He leaves a can of past blue ribbon in the fridge. Shut your mouth! You shut your mouth, you dumb! So Kenny is sent back to South Park, where everything will be fine and well. <laughs> hey, at least he wasn't sent back to Penn State. Sadly, Kenny's life gets worse come the specials. His friend group ends up fracturing, and to their credit, they try to keep Kenny out of the brunt of it by treating him like a child of divorce. Everything okay, buddy? Yeah, what's going on? 
We're almost done in here, Kenny. You liking that birthday cake flavored ice cream? Yeah, that's fine. No, no, no. Okay, you're doing great, pal. Even if they don't like each other, they still like Kenny. So they decide to divide up their time with him via joint custody. What are you guys talking about? Everything's gonna be okay, Kenny. I'll see you on Monday. And I'll come pick you up on Thursday, Kenny. And this is how life goes for the next few years. In the future specials, Kenny has the best life out of all the kids. Next to Carmen, he is an award-winning scientist and sleeps with any woman he wants. He even donated enough money to South Park Elementary to help kids like him. But ultimately, it's still empty. At his funeral, his best friend, Rabbi Cartman, gives a eulogy. Kenny was not a Jew, but he had so many amazing Jewish qualities. Qualities that I see in my loving wife over there, over there by the cow. The boys discover Kenny died of the current events variant. And since everybody but Clyde got vaccinated, they're stuck in South Park indefinitely. Going over Kenny's final plan, they discover that he died trying to go back in time to prevent current events from happening. Before he goes, he makes one final speech. In the event of Dr. McCormick's death, he wants everyone to know the group that is responsible for the way things are. Stan, Kyle, and Cartman. Oof. <laughs> Thankfully, the bad future is averted, and Kenny gets to live his best life. Yay! And that's Kenny McCormick. Is he the saddest kid in South Park? Well, next to Carmen and Butters, realistically, yes. Getting to be out of focus or not, there's no denying that Kenny has a sad home life. But this does not mean he's a bad character. He does indeed have his moments, especially when he takes off that orange.